Hello, in this mini-series I'm going to look at the process of texture sampling. If you've played computer games of any form in the last 20 years, uh, you'll be familiar with textures. It is the imagery, the pictures, that coat the polygon models of the games that we enjoy so much. They add a, a layer of realism, and can be exploited in a myriad of ways to create all sorts of wonderful effects. In fact, today we take texture sampling completely for granted. We could assume that the graphics card is mostly processing the geometry of the games, but actually that's not true. The graphics card's primary purpose is to sample textures as fast as possible. And I thought it might be quite interesting to build an application to explore, well, the mathematics of texture sampling. As always on the One Lone Coder channel, I like to give a little glimpse into the future of what it is that we're building before we start. And yes, it's a pixel game engine application, but it needn't be, as long as you've got the facility to have an array of data and the ability to display pixels, then you should be able to follow along with this video quite simply. There is nothing special required. Here on my screen I've got a texture, and I can use my middle mouse button to pan it around. I can also use the middle mouse button to zoom into the texture. And as we zoom, we're changing the spatial scale of the texture. This texture is carefully constructed to show these artifacts with these different grids. I also have some careful boundary conditions so I can look for off by one errors. And it's a mixture of natural imagery and artificially generated imagery. The whole screen is in texture space. That is, for every screen pixel, I'm sampling from this texture. I just so happen to have it set up right now that anything outside the boundaries of the original texture image is considered to be blank. I can change that by changing the border methods. Here would be clamping, here would be periodic, and here would be reflected periodic. If I zoom out a little bit, we can look at the differences. As we zoom into the texture, we can see that the individual textures pixels, the texels, if you were, occupy more than one screen pixel. They become little squares. In many instances, this is a very desirable effect. It is the pixel effect. But it does mean that if your texture is reasonably low resolution and you zoom in, it looks blocky. It looks old, perhaps. And so there are some texture sampling techniques to help avoid this. For example, we could buy linear filter and we can buy cubic filter. And as you can see, the quality of the images are improving as we zoom in. Ordinarily, a topic like this I would do in one video, but this year I'm going to be a little bit different because I simply don't have the time to do one hour long videos anymore. A combination of my personal life, having a child, and my work life is just not allowing that to happen. So what I'm doing this year, and it may be controversial, and I'd love your feedback in the comments below, is I'm going to try and do more regular videos, but of a shorter form factor. And to that end, specifically for this video, we're going to look at the environment used for rendering the texture space and how we're going to handle the border conditions. But let's get started with some texturing fundamentals. Here I have a texture. It's an image, nothing more. Specifically, this texture is 256 pixels wide by 256 pixels tall. And a pixel can really be defined as anything. But in this instance, we have a red component, a green component, a blue component, and an optional alpha component. The types of these components, for me, are typically 8-bit integers. But that needn't be the case. Depending on how we want the texture to be used, or how modern the technology is using the texture, this could be 16-bit, it could be floating point, it could be whatever is necessary for the end application. But at its most basic, let's assume we've got 8 bits for red, 8 bits for green, 8 bits for blue, and optionally 8 bits for alpha. Now, red, green and blue are obviously the red, green and blue components of the colours that make up the pixel. The alpha component is a bit of trickery. It's used to indicate how the texture should blend with something beneath it. For today, we're not really interested in alpha at all. But by having four 8-bit components, conveniently that's 32 bits, which is conveniently a standard C++ integer. When we say we are sampling from a texture, what we really mean is we are specifying a coordinate somewhere in the image, typically via an X coordinate and a Y coordinate. And given that our texture exists in memory as an array of pixels, it's important that this coordinate lies within that array. But this introduces two complexities. Firstly, what do we do if we want to sample the texture outside of the texture space? And secondly, what happens if, in the future, 
we decide to change the resolution of our texture. Our original sampling point effectively changes location. I should point out that for all my images, I'm assuming this top left is 0, 0. Let's assume our sampling point here is 140 by 60. In memory, our texture exists as a 1D array of pixels. And we get to use good old one lone code of favorite, y times width plus x to convert our 2D coordinate into a 1D coordinate. In memory, our texture may be stored in this order, going from the top left all the way to one end, and then it goes wraps round to the next row down, and across, and wraps round to the next row down, and so on, all the way, making one big long line of pixels. So we're converting our 2D coordinate into somewhere along this line, they just happen to represent the same pixel. Before we do this transformation, however, we want to consider where are we sampling in the texture space. If we're outside of the texture, we may have different approaches to how we handle that coordinate. For this series, I'm calling this the border method. And I'll illustrate a few basic ones. The second problem of changing the size of the texture means we need to use a size invariant coordinate system. We need to use normalized coordinates. In this instance, we assume that the texture isn't 256 pixels wide, it is simply 1 wide. Equally, it is 1 tall. A moment ago, I said that this was 140 by 60. Well, we can easily convert from pixel space to normalized space by dividing the x component by the width and the y component by the height. So that would give us 140 over 256 and 60 over 256 would give us a normalized coordinate of, just let me get my calculator, 0.546875 by 0.234375. Yes, normalized coordinates are disgustingly unwieldy, but look at it this way. Let's assume our normalized coordinate was 0.5 by 0.5, then I know that regardless of the size of the number of pixels that represent my image, that's going to be bang in the middle of it. So to read a specific location in a texture, we need to do the following transformations. Given a normalized text chord of 0.5 by 0.25, which puts us in the uh, top quarter halfway along, so somewhere about there, we need to denormalize that by multiplying by the dimensions of the image which becomes 128 by 64. We'll then need to convert this 2D denormalized coordinate into a 1D index so we can access the correct pixel in our memory. So this was y times width plus x, so 64 times 256 pixels wide plus 128, which is equal to 16512. Therefore, starting from the beginning up here, and going row by row, one pixel at a time, I know that by the time I get to here, the pixel I'm interested in, this is the 16,512th pixel of our texture. And this is a great starting point to demonstrate just the sheer volume of computation required to work with images. Straight away, we've had two multiplications here, a multiplication here, and an addition to convert from something useful to something actual. As I build this application, I'm going to throw in a quick timing indicator to help us estimate the performance impact of using better filtering techniques. Long time followers of the channel will know that I usually use the OLC Pixel Game Engine, it's my own creation, to demonstrate these algorithms. And today is going to be no exception, but I just want to emphasize again, you don't have to use the Pixel Game Engine to do these things. As long as you can read in data from a 2D array and perform some sort of floating point arithmetic, you can use whatever system you like to sample textures this way. Rather oddly, we're not going to be using the graphics card at all for any of this. It's all going to be CPU based, and we're really looking at how the interesting techniques affect the imagery. So let's start coding. I've already created a simple project in Visual Studio and added to it a single source file called Video Texture Sampling 1. In this source file, I'm including the Pixel Game Engine header file. It's a single file. There's no libraries to link or anything like that. You just include that header file. It allows you to have graphics in your C++ application quite simply. 
There's a base class called Pixel Game Engine, and from that I'm deriving a new class called Texture Sampling, which is our application class. Right now, it's pretty empty. All it has is two functions, onUserCreate, which is called once at the start of the application, and onUserUpdate, which is called every single frame. My int main is down here, and all I'm doing is creating an instance of my texture sampling class, giving it some dimensions. In this case, it's going to start as 512 by 480 pixels, where each pixel in the engine is 2 by 2 screen pixels on my monitor, and then I start the engine. There is one little addition I've added. Uh, quite a few videos I've been using now has transformed view. This is a way of handling panning and zooming, and I've talked about the maths of panning and zooming in a different video. However, it's all nicely wrapped up in this transform view object. In on user create, I initialize the transform view object with the original dimensions of the screen, and in my on user update function, I call the handle pan and zoom function of the transform view object. This allows me to use the middle mouse button to pan and zoom the imagery. In the example I showed at the start of this video, I implied that the entire application space is actually texture space. And I'm really using the transform view to pan and zoom around that texture space. Therefore, for every screen pixel, we need to convert that screen pixel into the space of the texture, use that texture space location to sample the texture appropriately, and then draw that sample at the corresponding screen location. That sounds awfully complex, but it isn't. I'm going to start by iterating through every pixel on my display. I have a 2D vector type here, it's just an X and Y coordinate. And these two nested for loops allow me to iterate through all of the pixels across the screen and down the screen. That pixel is in screen space. So I want to convert that into the space of my texture. And the space of my texture is managed by the transformed view. The transform view provides a screen to world function to do exactly that transformation. We haven't got as far as even defining what a texture is yet, but we can start to see if that's worked. If I take the world sample vector that is returned and draw its X and Y coordinates, I should be able to visualize the normalized texture space. Pixel types in the Pixel Game Engine are for 8-bit components. But there's another method to construct one called Pixel F, which takes in values 0 to 1 for each channel. So this would be 0 to 1 for the red, 0 to 1 for the green, and we're not bothering with a blue channel because I'm only visualizing the x and y coordinates of our texture space. Since this texture space coordinate can easily go beyond 1, and in fact less than 0, the pixel f function will wrap that, meaning that when we run this application, what we should see is a nice representation of the texture space, and it should look a bit like a grid. Let's take a look. Hmm, this is not quite what I expected. Nothing here is very accurate. Along the x-axis, we're not seeing a change in red. Well, we are, but it's a change in red at this y-axis location, and it's going the wrong way. For some reason, we've got different shades of yellow, indicating there's different amounts of blending going on. What is going on here? Well, it's unusual for me to throw in such a complexity at the start of a series like this, but this is a perfect example of a sampling problem. I have not yet specified the spatial scale of the texture world we see on the screen. If I use the middle mouse button to change the zoom, we'll very quickly realise that not all is what it seems to be. If I start to zoom out, the first level of zoom out is this crazy high definition set of squares. It's a very rapid transition from one to the other. If I zoom out again, it looks like we're zooming out. We keep zooming out and then we start to see patterns. And then it looks like we've gone round. Nothing is making any sense. So let's zoom in. And occasionally, you can see it burst occasionally into full-scale squares. Let's keep zooming in and zooming in and zooming in. And as we zoom in, we start to see things stabilizing. Not only that, but they're stabilizing and actually showing correct imagery. We see an increase in red along the x-axis, an increase in green along the y-axis, and we see yellow where the red and green blend together. In fact, what we see in this cell here is one unit texture in our texture space, and it's repeated. It's what we wanted. So an interesting little digression there to look at how sampling is really a problem when we're taking information from 2D arrays and can actually give you all sorts of false results, which may be difficult to debug. That said, that specific sampling problem is a problem for a later video in this series when we look at zooming out on images.
today and in the next part we're looking specifically at how do we zoom in on images to reduce the blockiness artifacts. But good, we're now visualizing texture space. To my application I'm going to create a new namespace and a new class called texture. To my texture class I'm just going to give it a default constructor, it doesn't need to do anything. And within the texture I'm going to have a protected member variable called msprite. Now this is where things get a little bit odd and superfluous because I'm actually using the Pixel Game Engine's built-in image manipulation tools in order to represent my 2D array of pixels. What we'll see in this series is, other than for loading this image in the first place, all of the reading from this imagery and all of the rendering of any imagery does not happen using any of the built-in Pixel Game Engine functions. I want a way to load the image data into the sprite, so I'm going to create another function called load from file that takes in a string allocates a new sprite in memory and loads that image. If you'll permit me, I'm going to add a little bit of groundwork now just to make things easier later on. The first is an enum class called sample method. This selects between the different algorithms used to calculate the final sample value. In a similar way, I'm also going to add another enum class called border method, where the user can specify how do we handle samples that are outside of the texture space. And in this video today, we're going to look at all of the border methods. To use our texture, the user will want to call a sample function. Here it is, and they're going to pass in a normalized texture coordinate, VUV, and specify a sample method and a border method. Depending on the configuration, we construct an output pixel, which represents the sample, and we return it. This specific function is happening within the texture space. Within the memory space, we need something a bit different, and all of the border method handling happens within the memory space. So I'm going to add a second function called getPixel. Note that the first sampling method takes in a floating point coordinate. The second getPixel method takes in an integer type coordinate. This enforces that we're going to be accessing purely memory in a computer. We can't access half memories. The first border method I want to look at I'm calling blank, and it's the simplest. We check that the supplied 2D integer coordinate is within the bounds of the image itself, and if it is, we read the pixel at that location using y times width plus x. If the requested coordinate does not lie within the bounds of the image, then we're simply returning a dark blue pixel. In order to return anything at all, we have to call this getPixel function and that will happen through our sample function. Note that sample is public. It's the only public facing sampling function I'm providing to the texture. This function will be provided with a normalized coordinate in texture space. So first, I want to denormalize that coordinate by multiplying it by the dimensions of the texture. I now have a denormalized coordinate, which is the pixel location within the image. The specific maths of the sampling I'm going to discuss in detail in part two, but the simplest method of sampling we can have is called point sampling. So let's take a quick look at that. Here I have a very small image. I've zoomed in on it so the pixels are quite large. In pixel space this would be 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 and 5. It is 5 pixels wide by 4 pixels tall. We've already denormalized the coordinate coming in which has resulted in 2.5 by 1.5, for example. So that's here. Since we've zoomed in, a pixel on our image occupies many screen pixels. That's why it looks like a little rectangle or a little square. To turn this denormalized coordinate into an integer-based index, we need to truncate. So we can literally just chop off the decimal point components, which gives us two and one, indicating it's this cell that we're interested in. So any denormalized coordinates that land within this area in the image at any spatial scale will always return this pixel's value. In C++ we can do this by simply casting the coordinates to an integer or we can call the floor function. Floor function has the effect of always rounding down. Our point sampling method therefore is very simple. We take our denormalized coordinate we floor it, which gets rid of the uh, values after the decimal point. Even though I floored it, it's actually cast to an integer anyway. And I use that 2D coordinate to get the correct pixel from our image. 
To the main application, I'm now going to add an instance of our texture. And to start working on a bit of a user interface, I'm also going to store the currently in effect sample and border methods. I'm no longer interested in visualizing the coordinates of texture space. Instead, I want to call our sample method, passing in the texture space coordinate and drawing the returned pixel in screen space. Whilst I'm here, I'm also going to add in some measure of performance. I'm going to create a time point before this loop and a time point after this loop and calculate the elapsed time. And then with some characteristically fancy shadowing, I'm going to draw some instructions and the current elapsed time to the screen. In my onUserCreate function, I want to load an image into my texture. So let's take a look. Well, so far there's nothing. But as I pan and zoom, I can see there's a tiny little red dot. I'm going to zoom in on that red dot. Well, there we go. There is our image. So perhaps we need to initialize to a more appropriate spatial scale. But what's pleasing to see is that we can see right up to the edges of the image. But anything beyond the border of the image has been set to a dark blue pixel. This is point sampling with our blank border method. It's also pretty quick. Remember the whole screen is being sampled. It's not just the bit that you see and it's taking about three milliseconds per frame to do so. I think being able to access the dimensions of the texture is quite a useful thing to have. So let's add in a function which does just that. I'm going to get my sprites pointer and call the size function. Now I can tell my transformed view that on startup, it should be scaled to, well, the texture. Let's take a look. The 256 by 256 texture now has a one-to-one -one relationship with the screen pixels. We can verify this by looking at the fine resolution grid, which is a white pixel, black pixel, white pixel, black pixel grid. As we change the spatial scale, we can see different patterns again. This is what was happening when we were visualizing the texture coordinates. I mean, look at this one. The fine resolution grid here now looks like it's got really big pixels. As we start to zoom in, we see other artifacts. It may even start to look like things are bulging spherically. We see certain lines have thin pixels, whereas others have chunky pixels. There's inconsistencies. These disappear as we zoom in because we've got more screen pixels conveying the lower resolution information behind them. In the next video in this series, we'll look at how we can filter these pixels to add some smoothing to them. Let's add in now the next border method. I'm calling it clamp. In our getPixel function, I'll add this in as the next case. Clamp. The purpose of clamp is to repeat the last pixel along the boundary of that texture. Now I can take my incoming 2D coordinate and call a clamp function upon it. Any values less than zero get clamped to zero and any values greater than these values I specify here get clamped to those values. So as you can see between them, this defines the texture in pixel space. It does it axis independently. So if I clamped X, I don't necessarily clamp Y. And just as before, I sample the data in exactly the same way, y times width plus x. To the main application, I need just a little bit of user interface to handle the selection of the border method. I'm going to map to keys one and two to switch between the two methods. And that's it. So let's take a look. Here's my texture, and I'm currently sampling with point sampling and the blank border method. If I press the two button, I now go on to the clamped border method. And now you can start to see what clamping really means. Recall I put these edge conditions in just so I can sort of see where the corners of my texture are. And as I clamp, when we're sampling in the texture space over here, it samples the last valid value within the texture space. Even though right now this doesn't look that useful, it's quite useful for just hiding up little errors and anomalies when you're sampling things just around the borders of textures. The next border method I'm interested in is periodic. I want the texture to repeat. In unit texture space, we know that the whole texture is represented between zero and one in any given axis. Well, the same texture can be represented between one and two, and again, between two and three. Let's add another case statement to our getPixel function to handle the periodic condition. 
As with clamp, it's a very simple arithmetic translation. I take the integer modulus between the supplied coordinate and the dimension of the sprite in that axis. I take care to use the absolute value of the coordinate. We will be supplying negative coordinates in some instances, and we can't pass negative coordinates onto our 2D to 1D transformation because then we will end up definitely with a read out of bounds. I'll map to the three key the periodic border method. Let's take a look. So here is our original image, and if I press 3, we can see it repeats. Now, to begin with, I'm only interested in repeats in the positive direction in both axes. So I've moved our original image up to the top left, and in texture space, we're increasing in coordinates going across and down the screen. And as I zoom out, we can see it repeats and repeats and repeats indefinitely. It's great. This is great for texturing things like brickwork or indeed certain voxel-based cube games which really get up my nose. Adding these little border conditions is quite useful. It shows that we're sampling the textures appropriately. We're not missing a row or a column at the end. However, there is a switch and we can see it here. So this location identifies as 0, 0 in texture space. Anything to the bottom right of this is positive and anything to the top left of this is negative. Now, as we go negative, we're still sampling accurately. That's good, we're not missing things. But along the axes themselves, we do start to miss an individual row and a column. We might address that later, but this isn't true periodic. This is periodic that's reflected in the main X and Y axes. Could be quite useful uh, if you'd want your texture to look somewhat seamless. But let's say we wanted true periodic. Let's add in another border method which corrects for that sampling when we're sampling negative coordinates. I'm going to call this method reflected periodic. Maybe corrected periodic is a better name, but uh, I'm running with this. This reflected periodic border method is a little more complicated. First, I do a check to see is the coordinate negative. If it's not negative, then I want to sample just as I was doing above with the periodic sampling. It's exactly the same, and that applies to both X and Y. If the coordinate is negative, then I want to invert it with respect to the dimensions of the texture. I'm going to map this border method to the four key. Just a bit of a quality of life upgrade. Now I've got quite a few border methods. I'm going to display on the screen which one is currently in effect. And it's also going to be possible to lose the original texture. So I'm going to use a, a quirky pixel game engine function called draw rect decal, which will draw a one screen pixel wide rectangle around the original texture. As you can see, I'm using the transform view to do it, and it's simply a unit rectangle. So now let's take a look. There's my original texture with this yellow border. Now it doesn't matter what spatial scale I'm at, this yellow border is always one pixel wide. And it's a nice way to delineate between the edge of the texture in texture space. Let's have a look now at our regular periodic function. So this was the one where it had reflection in. And if I press the 4 key, I can now cancel out that reflection. It does look like there's still a bit of an off by one error along the axis. However, zoomed out, it is now a truly periodic sampled texture. If I keep zooming out, we can start to see these strange artifacts appear that we saw before. We're beginning to sample at such spatial frequency. I mean, look at this one. That looks like we've zoomed right back in. We've just looked on a perfect sampling frequency that reveals the image. It looks like we've really zoomed in, but actually we're really zoomed out and we're looking at many, many, many different textures being sampled in the right places. So let's have one final look at what we've created today. If I press the one key, we can see the texture is uh, sampled only within the boundary of the texture. I can clamp to the edges of the texture. I can have the texture repeat itself periodically with a reflection around the origin of texture space. And I can negate that reflection as well. As these methods grew more sophisticated, they took longer to perform. So here we've got an average of three to four milliseconds per frame for the blank border method. For the clamping, it's about four to five. For the periodic, yeah, five to six. And for the reflected periodic, again, five to six, uh, only because there's really just an if condition getting in the way there.
Well, that's not a bad start at all. We've developed a very simple application that allows us to explore the space in and around the texture. When we're sampling outside of the texture's normal space, uh, we can apply different border conditions to sample things differently. In the next part of this series, we'll zoom right into the image and have a look at what we can do about these blocky pixels and tidy them up a bit. But until then, I encourage you to go and play with the live interactive demo of this video. There's a link below. If you have enjoyed this video, give me a big thumbs up. Please have a think about subscribing. Come and have a chat on the Discord server, and I'll see you next time. Take care.